think we're yeah. all ready to get going. Um, welcome back to campus to many of you. You guys have a wonderful spring break. Um, a couple disclaimers, apologies. I'm so sorry for the confusion and the timing today. You guys got conflicting emails um, from the CPU group of mine, so I appreciate you all being here at 2 p.m. Thank you so much. Um, and then also I know that um, for those of, of our colleagues that are listening um, to the recording, I know that there was also um, some com conflicts with other meetings and things on campus. So um, for the faculty who are listening later to the recording, I really appreciate your flexibility um, in being able to attend your meetings, but then also um, catch up on the training. So thank you all so much for that. Um, so just a little bit of, again, just a little bit of context around the meeting today. Um, we pushed this one, I think, you know, you all got the explanation in the email, but I just really felt like we needed to complete the mapping portion, right? Like we needed to do that, get that deliverable, turn it in, um, kind of come over the hump of spring break and we're back on campus before we moved on for this training. So um, I wanted to first thank you all so much for your hard work on the curriculum map. Um, you did receive feedback, and that was really for you to consider that feedback, right? So I know I had conversations with many of you um, about that feedback, and so that was not, you know, a hard and fast, you have to do these revisions in order for them to move forward, but it was things to consider as um, we looked over those maps. So many of you have had conversations about that feedback. We were able to talk through or work through any any issues, any thoughts, and so I um, appreciate you reaching out um, and having those those conversations. I think that's really important as we create documents. Um, it's not necessarily going to be a one size fits all. It's not necessarily going to be you know these hard and fast rules. These are representations of your curriculum, um, and so I appreciate you again thinking really deeply about that, having those conversations, engaging that dialogue, and um, kind of figuring out what's the best fit for you and for your program, for your courses um, as you move forward. And then hopefully today, um, we're going to talk about kind of how those pieces um, start to fit together. And so um, what we're going to be looking at today is we're going to do just a kind of brief review of the work that's been completed so far. And again, kind of starting to think about how these pieces fit together. Um, we're going to talk about some categories for assessment methods. So this is how we're going to start kind of casting the vision for what that work, look, that work looks like um, moving forward. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about choosing appropriate methods to collect data on and on. And then finally, we're going to wrap up our time today discussing next steps um, and then the new stipend role. So this is kind of that piece where we were combining with the open form that was already scheduled for today, do a little bit of the training, and then um, move towards the portion where we're really, again, kind of casting that vision, rolling out that new role as our time together and kind of this cohort starts to um, wind down. We'll be looking forward to those next, um, next steps in that new role. So again, as we um, kind of talk about what we have done and what we will do, uh, the goal is to really fit these pieces together. So we've already talked in our training, kind of going back to the beginning of fall semester, right, the training on our learning outcomes. We created those program learning outcomes. Um, you know, what, how are we building on those? Well, we've done our curriculum maps at this point. And so how do we take those maps of what what are we going to use them for? How are we going to utilize them moving forward? What purpose do they serve and how are they going to inform our data collection? Um, the piece about you know, teaching strategy, so what you are all doing in the classroom, the teaching and learning that's already occurring in your, in your program, where does that fit in? And then again, today we're going to talk a little bit about assessment methods and measures, and how all these pieces fit together um, and what that structure is going to look like moving forward as we kind of build these puzzle pieces and we start moving forward with our assessment cycles. All right, so to kick off today, um, again, a brief recap um, of our program level learning outcomes. So our program level learning outcomes are those clear, concise statements that describe what students can demonstrate as a result of a given educational experience. When we're talking about our program level learning outcomes, right, that's what students can demonstrate as a result of going through the program. Um, there are specific statements that are often written using format. Students will be able to write blank in the action verb. We spent a lot of time on this, so this is just a brief refresher for you. Um, again, describe these specific behaviors that a student of your program should demonstrate after completing the program. 
Um, and so when we talked about writing those, we're talking about writing them at the appropriate level. Even going through this experience, um, some of you have started to re-examine those, right? You kind of re-question, you know, maybe this isn't the appropriate level. Maybe there's a different verb I need to use here. Maybe this isn't one of the most important things for my program. It doesn't need to be represented those five to seven statements. We've already started to engage in those conversations, and that's exactly where you should be, right? It's not necessarily written in stone. Um, this is really that iterative process where we're going to continue to re-examine and re-look at some of these. So if you have taken a second look at your program level learning outcomes as a result of this work, that's great, right? Um, and if they're working for right now, we're going to start building those assessment plans um, based off of those, that's great. And in the future, maybe you know, you're going to take a uh, re-look at those, right, on a, a kind of a regular basis. Um, so those outcomes are really uh, asking the question or answering the question, what's expected from a graduate of the program? Um, what does the student know? What can the student do? Um, and we're going to talk about this a little bit when we get into the curriculum mapping, but um, some of the questions that came up in the curriculum mapping is that idea of the language around mastered, right? What does it mean to have mastered this outcome? And it's really talking about the level of the program level learning outcome, right? So if you wrote them for a two-year program, mastery is really getting them at the end of that two-year program, right? What should students be able to do? Not necessarily looking more forward to transfer or four-year, but as a result of your program, what should students know and be able to do? So um, that issue came up a little bit in our curriculum mapping, but that's something we're going to continue to work through together. Um, one thing I definitely wanted to emphasize as well is that idea that you're not going to be able to assess all possible outcomes, right? Remember we talked about creating those outcomes, it's those five to seven, you know, really important statements, certificates, certificates maybe four to six, um, <coughs> that students must know or be able to do as a result of your program. And so you're going to make decisions, right, based on the context of your program um, and the characteristics of the students that are going through that program. Um, and then not all outcomes are going to be written at the same expectation or cognitive level. Going back to our Bloom's taxonomy, um, for some in the two-year program, it might be at the end they may need to be able to identify or describe. Where for others of you, it might be that demonstrate or really assessing or analyzing. So not all program outcomes are going to be written at the same level. Um, and that's going to, um, again, be different across the programs across our curriculum. Um, and this is a quotation that I uh, heard many times, but um, to uh, replicate here. Not everything that counts can be measured, and not everything that can be measured counts. So you could, right, assess so many things as a result of students going through your program, but again, what we're really looking for here are those really key outcomes, right? The five to seven, at the end of your program, students should be able to do this, and focusing on those few statements that you really want to um, kind of key in on, and those to be the focus of your assessment. Do you have any questions here? <coughs> Hopefully all of that was a quick review of where we've been. Um, so we've just covered curriculum maps, I'm not going to go too uh, in-depth here, but again, the idea of curriculum mapping is identify, identifying where students get a chance to learn, develop, and master performance, uh, the performance of outcomes, and again, I want to be really specific on this word, right, the vocabulary that we use of master is at the um, program level outcome level, right, so what you say students will do as a result of your program that's what we're talking about when we use that word master. Do you guys have any questions on that? I just want to make sure that we're clear on the vocabulary we're using, because that was a piece that I had I talked through with, I had, had conversations with um, several individuals. Um, and so this mapping, right, this is a tool that really makes explicit the cumulative and integrative nature of student learning. Um, and it becomes a tool to really promote meaningful conversations about what students should be doing as a result of the program, right? That idea of not just in one individual's classroom, but the results of the learning across a program. So now let's dive into kind of that quick recap of our program level outcomes and the curriculum mapping, right? Those are two pieces. The first one is the deliverable for fall. Um, curriculum mapping was our deliverable for um, this semester. So now we're going to start talking about kind of looking at 
um, how do we build on these really foundational documents and how do we start looking at our program level assessment. Um, and this is, you know, a key part of our focus visit that's coming up in April 2020. So um, the idea of building, you know, having the structures in place, so the outcomes and um, the curriculum maps and then kind of the, the documented schedules moving forward of how we're going to assess that on a systematic basis, um, and then how we're rolling out our program level assessment. So that's going to be a big part of kind of our work moving forward into the next academic year. Um, so as we're going through this, you know, any questions that you have, please raise your hand, right? We can definitely have this be a little bit more interactive. Feel free to stop me on any of the slides and we can kind of talk through this together. So program level assessment. Um, when we're talking about assessment at the classroom level, right, when we're looking in our own classes, um, what we're really looking at is assessing a specific student's learning, right? So in a section of your course, when you're assessing individual students, you're really looking at, you know, what has this student learned, right? We're talking about the course level across sections. So how are students, Christopher, you just want to come on up here? Okay, great, come on up. Um, so uh, having students in a course, um, you know, how are students learning across the specific course? But when we're looking at the program level, we're assessing all students learning, right? We're not uh, assessing just a specific student, but we're looking at all students learning. But it also gives us an opportunity to examine ourselves, right, across the program. And how are we doing? And again, having the emphasis be on an individual instructor, right, in a specific course, but really pulling back to that program level and how are all of we as a student moves through our different courses, whether that's the general education curriculum, getting into the program specific courses, how are we all contributing to that student's learning, and um, how are we doing um, as students pass through our courses, um, and how is our curriculum doing in preparing them to learn those outcomes. Does that make sense? Okay, so a little bit of a shifting of the lens, but I just want to be clear on kind of the, the level that we're looking at. So I want to spend a little bit of time here because I think this is really going to, this is kind of where those puzzle pieces fit together, right? The slide that I showed you up front, um, but then kind of where those pieces are put together. So when we ask the question, what are students supposed to learn? At the program level, those are our outcomes, right? Those specific statements saying this is what students should have learned as a result of um, going through the program. Now the question, where are they learning it? Right, that's where we look to our curriculum map. So if I, I want to know right, where a student is being introduced, developed, or where they're able to show mastery in a specific program level outcome, we're going to look at your curriculum map. We're going to identify <coughs> that program level learning outcome, and that's where it's that quick visualization of where students have the opportunity to learn that particular outcome. We're all tracking with me here, right? So these are how those documents start to build the foundation for how we're then going to assess student learning, right? So our outcomes, our curriculum map answer those questions. What are students supposed to learn? Where are they learning it, right? So that's where we're going to look to those uh, two documents to do for us. Now, the question, when we start to build program level assessments, the question that whether you're sitting down with me, with Christopher, right, as we have those conversations, what I ask you, right, or the conversation that we're going to have is how can they show that they've learned that outcome, right? So you have an example of an outcome, hopefully you guys can reflect on your own program level outcomes, but if I'm expecting a student to demonstrate that they have learned this outcome, how do you know, right? That's not just a rhetorical question, we're going to be answering that in a second, right? But how, how do you know that, right? So how can they show you that they have learned? And that's when we're going to talk about our assessment methods. What can they do? How can they demonstrate that they've learned? And in a room this size, even just seeing the different disciplines that are rented in the different programs, that's going to vary widely, right? That's going to look very different um, in some of our programs and some of our courses, all right? And so we're going to be able to talk about that in just a moment. And then number four, how can we evaluate their learning? So how can they show, right? What are they going to be able to do? What's the method? But that's the measure, right? How can we evaluate their learning? We're going to talk about those in just a second. But what's the tool? What are we going to use to evaluate um, if they have learned? 
And then the last one is then the big question, right, that we're after this entire process is how can we improve student learning, okay? So um, a little bit later, I'm gonna show you another image of that assessment cycle, right? But that's basically what we're doing here. What are students supposed to learn? Where are they learning it? How can they show that they've learned? How can we evaluate? And ultimately, this entire process is there for how can we improve student learning. Okay, any questions on this step? So the very broken down version, right, of exactly the process that we're gonna go through in the next year in terms of assessing our programs and student learning in our programs. Right. Feel free to jump in. Yeah, I do want to jump in. So um, number five, how can we improve student learning? Um, has a corollary, how can we improve our ability to teach, right? So this onus isn't on the student always, right? So students have their part to do in learning, but we have our part to do in teaching. And I do think going through this process in a very focused and in, you know, intentional way um, will highlight perhaps to you and review that, oh, wow, I have this um, outcome that I'm expecting, but am I actually teaching directly to that outcome? Is my assignment actually truly focused on that outcome, or have I just sort of assumed I taken care of it? So I think that will also be incredibly valuable to have this opportunity to really pause, take a look at what we're doing in our classroom, and, you know, I think it'll be refreshing, reviling, you know, help. That's the goal. Um, but then just to build off what Christopher was saying, right, it's not even just those conversations that take place as a result of what you're doing in your courses, but hopefully that's then sparking conversations with your colleagues, what they are doing in their courses, not just in your department area, right, but also um, with faculty in other departments, right? If you're expecting, you know, a certain level of learning in your course, maybe you're talking to some of your colleagues about some of their courses, or we're starting to branch out and talk across the college, right, how do we all collectively, um, what is our role in ensuring students are learning in our classroom? And I know some of you actually had this experience in the workshop, mm -hmm. the mapping workshop, where in your own curriculum, not necessarily across curriculum, but in your own curriculum, by doing the map, identify, oh, wow, mm -hmm. right? There's a, a, a gap here, there's a hole, there's a deficit, but something doesn't actually link up, something doesn't actually map. Um, so I think you, some of you already had that experience. This then is the next step and can continue, I think, to be elucidated. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah, and again, in some of the conversations we had as sort of feedback from the curriculum maps, right, that, those were some of those conversations of, you know, I'm not quite able to map those, right, or maybe there needs to be a little bit more occurring in multiple courses in order to really truly reach mastery in this outcome. So those are the kinds of conversations, again, have those conversations, that's not a bad place to be, right? Those are great conversations to be having, and that's exactly what we're after is as we build out this documentation, really looking at the ways that we can start to improve our curriculum and the teaching and learning that's going on in both our courses and in our programs. All right, so let's talk a little bit about assess assessment methods, right? So we have these foundational documents. The question we're going to ask is, like, how do we know that students have learned these outcomes? How do we know that? So, I'm gonna ask you that question, right? How do you know if students have learned? We don't have to get super philosophical here, but if we just wanna pop through, right? Like, in your courses, in your program, right, in the classes that you teach, how do you know? How do students demonstrate their learning to you in the courses that you teach? Well, skill demonstration. Yeah. So they show you it, right? You ask them to do something and they show you it. Great. Capstone project. Mm -hmm. The capstone project. Great. <clears throat> Skill demonstration, capstone project. What else? Exams. Exams. Exams, always. Right? <laughs> what kind of exam? Practical. Practical? Great. Do you yeah. More than practical, they need to tell you the why is okay. it is getting done. Anyone can just get 
a replace a clutch or brakes. But why are you doing that? Brakes. Yes. They need to be explain. The question: How do you know they know? Well, not just performance. They need to tell you why. Right. That's great. That, that word performance, right? Yeah. Because in a way, across disciplines, right? What the students are doing to show you that they have learned is in some way a performance, right? Maybe that performance is filling little bubbles on the scan drum, but it's a performance, right? So if I'm in music, you can clearly see performance. If you're in the kitchen and you're cooking, you're performing. But performance, I think, is a key sort of way to sort of a broad scope is an umbrella that covers a lot of what we do. Intubating someone. Performance. You guys do that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Our students take a national, three national exams, standardized exams. Yeah. Yep. Anything else? Anything we have about? In what way? How do they demonstrate it? Well, they, yeah, they're presented a problem with data, and they can analyze that data to come up with a particular outcome. Yeah. Or, or Are they telling result. you that in a written way? They can do it in a written way. They can yeah. Anything else? What were you missing? Yeah, where are the English faculty? No one has said essence. Speed. Yeah, correct. We have a couple of classes where the students really learn dozens of theories, so they have to do a research paper and tie the theory back to an individual so they can choose. Weird, but they get to choose serial killers or mass murderers. I've helped your students with that assignment before. <laughs> they get to tie it back to one of the theories because yeah. somebody just won a serial killer or mass murderer. Something happened in that person's life, and I just want them to try to track it back to one of the dozen or so theories we talked about. Right. So, measurable that way for me. Yeah. So, hopefully, of the things that we've talked about, this is new. Right, we are educators. Right, we're having students. Or we are having students demonstrate their learning constantly in our classrooms. Right, so none of this should be new. Right, none of this is a surprise. All of these are methods that uh, maybe some of them you haven't used before because of your discipline. Right, but hopefully at least one of these has resonated with something that you do in in your classroom. Right. So this is just a few that I threw up, right? Um, written surveys, questionnaires, um, exit and other interviews, standardized exams, globally developed assessments, so whether that's you know exams you've uh, developed yourself, um, focus groups, portfolios, we had our capsule portfolio, portfolio, simulations, extra examiners, oral exams, speeches, right, you name it, right? You can keep going and going and going. So we have students, right, demonstrate their learning all the time in our classroom. So when we're talking about assessment methods, right, we're already doing so many of these in our courses. Um, and so when we're talking about assessment methods, again, this is just to kind of have that shared language around what we're doing. Um, but these are not new concepts for, for any of us. <clears throat> so a couple, two distinctions are to make this idea between direct methods of assessment and direct methods. And so we talked about this a little bit. Um, in our training in the fall, but this is just kind of again a quick refresher. The idea of direct methods. So direct methods provide for the direct examination or observation of student knowledge or skills. So when we have direct methods of assessment, they require a student to represent or demonstrate their learning. That idea that Christopher um, said was you know the performance, right? The student performance able to assess that. So some of those direct methods, right? Standardized exams, maybe common questions on an exam, like a final exam. Again, locally developed assessments, whether that's in your department or here at the institution. Portfolios, oral exam, research paper projects, pre-post comparisons, a capstone evaluation. And I'm sure you guys can think of many other ones, right? But these direct assessments are asking students to perform a, to a specific uh, outcome, and you are able to evaluate right, the level of performance, directly assess um, their learning. Indirect method, or methods, on the other hand, so they, um, indirect methods of student learning determine um, the opinion or self-report of the extent or value of learning experiences. So these methods capture student perceptions of their learning, <coughs> and how well the educational environment supports that learning. So if we're doing indirect methods of assessment, these can be things like surveys or questionnaires, right? Asking students, you know, what were the outcomes or giving them the outcomes and 
and you know how well do you feel like you can you you're, you're confident in these outcomes, right? So asking students um, their own perceptions of their learning. Um, how well have you met these outcomes throughout the course um, of this course or program? Um, exit interviews or other interviews. So uh, students upon graduation, right, asking them those questions, whether it's a short questionnaire or whether you're doing interviews. Um, same thing with focus groups, right, asking students their perception of learning. Now, this can also come in other forms. For example, um, alumni or employer surveys. So asking employers how students have learned throughout that program. Same thing with alumni, how well do you feel like this program prepared you for employment in this field? Um, those can be other indirect uh, methods. And then also some other ways to potentially get at these indirect methods, things like retention transfer studies, graduation transfer rates, as well as job placement rates. So other indirect um, measures of, or methods of student learning. So when we think about choosing an assessment method, again, moving forward, when we're going to talk about building out those assessment plans, these are going to be some of the conversations, along with asking things like, you know, how do you know that students are learning? How can we demonstrate that learning? You know, asking things like, um, for this outcome, right, what is going to be the best method for students to show you that they've learned? So you really want to match the assessment method with the outcome. Right, so you're going to start with the outcome in mind, take a look at that curriculum map, say where should students be expected to demonstrate mastery of this outcome, you know, where, which course, where would we want to assess this, what point in their learning, and then saying, you know, what's the best method to capture that data, right? So match the method with the learning outcome. <coughs> um, different methods are going to be more appropriate for um, different outcomes, right? So if that outcome, again, Thinking of Bloom's taxonomy, when we're looking at those outcomes, um, you're going to have a different method if you're asking students to um, describe or identify than you would if you're asking students to um, perform, right, analyze, um, be able to show you something. Those are going to be different methods. So really, this is up to the outcomes that you've written, um, as well as how you feel like the students can best show their learning. Um, also, when we're thinking about choosing an assessment method, you want those assessment results to be usable, right? You don't want to be a method that's not going to give you data that's going to be useful to you as you're thinking about how to improve student learning um, in your program. So as we're thinking through and having those conversations, we really want to think about with the end in mind, right? What data am I looking for and how should that be collected so that that's going to be usable for me, for my colleagues, and improving student learning in the program, right? We don't want to be collecting um, data in a method that's not going to be useful for you. Um, and then if possible, um, identify multiple methods for assessing each outcome. That doesn't mean that you have to assess multiple times, uh, multiple methods um, for each outcome, but it's saying identify a few. Maybe the first time that you assess outcome, you might want to use one method, and the next time you might want to use another, right? So if that if it's appropriate, if it's possible, um, think about different ways that you can, um, uh, different methods for assessing each outcome. Any questions here? So let's briefly talk about assessment measures. So assessment measures is really looking at how will we score student learning? So that method, again, thinking about maybe it's an exam, maybe it's a paper, maybe it's a speech, right? These different ways that students can demonstrate their learning and we can know if they've learned. Um, but the measures is talking about how are we scoring student learning. Um, and again, this is a conversation that we're going to enter in more as we start talking, building out your assessment plans um, and, your, um, and actually uh, collecting data. But really, it's talking about, you know, what are those scoring tools? So scoring tools provide quantitative or qualitative data that will inform faculty of the extent to which the <coughs> level of student performance is being met. So that is how you are evaluating student learning, right, is this assessment measure. So assessment measures, really, I help you identify strengths and weaknesses in performance and then ultimately provide direction for improvement. So just a few basic examples of this, right? Probably the most famous or infamous is a rubric, right? So this idea that you have a rubric with different performance indicators, right? What students should be able to um, demonstrate. 
then you have a scoring system, right? So whether that's zero to three, right, one to five, whatever that rubric looks like, and then kind of in the center, you have these descriptions of student performance. So if you're using that individually in your course, you can quickly um, score how a student um, uh, demonstrated their learning. Again, the method could be various, right? And that's where um, it's really helpful when we're using rubrics maybe across different courses um, or across uh, the same course but different instructors. Is if you want instructors having them demonstrate in a specific in a paper, right? Maybe someone's doing a um, case study, right? Maybe someone's doing a speech, right? Students can demonstrate their learning in various ways, but the measure is going to be, let's say, for example, a rubric, and students have to show a certain level of learning, a certain level of knowledge, even though the method may be different. Does that make sense? So um, rubrics can be helpful, especially at the program level, because um, faculty can be doing different methods, but if they're using the same measure, you can still see how students are performing across courses or um, <coughs> across the program. Does that make sense? Do you have any questions on that? Okay. Um, it could be as simple as a checklist, right? Um, for many of you, it's a performance, right? Or they're demonstrating their learning in a very tangible way. Um, the checklist could be, did they demonstrate it correctly or not? Right? So yes, they did, or no, they could not show me that they could perform this specific skill. Um, so checklists could be great. Again, multiple faculty could be using the same checklist and saying, yes, they were able to show me that they could do this, or no, they could not show me that they could do this um, successfully or to the level that uh, we need them to in order to demonstrate competency. Right? Um, and average scores, right, for those of you who said something like a final exam or exhaustion, um, the different measures could be just the average score, right, um, and then being able to break that down um, to get more usable data. Or the number or percentage correct, right, so the number of students who got, um, you know, question 14 correct on this quiz, number of students who got, you know, answer or the question 15 correct, so um, being able to have different measures for um, those to evaluate student learning. Okay, this is very brief, right? Very top level, but hopefully this is kind of um, as we're thinking through this, right? You're starting to connect this, this to things that you're doing in your courses already, um, and you can start to kind of connect to your content um, and to what you're already doing in the classroom. Right? Any questions, sir? <coughs> All right. Now it's time for an activity because I've been talking long enough. So this is what we're going to do. I've got a couple cards in front of you in the middle of your table. So feel free if you have a uh, paper and just want to jot down on that. But this just gave you an opportunity to, if you want just a quick scratch piece of paper, kind of jot down some ideas. Um, I want you to kind of connect this, again, to what you're doing and already in your classroom. Uh, but kind of connect this as you think about program um, level assessment. So with kind of the program level outcomes and the curriculum maps to the top of mind, I um, want you to think about um, these questions. So first, I want you to think about choosing a programmable learning outcome. It's okay if you don't have them memorized, right? But what, what's one of the things that you expect students to be able to demonstrate as a result of one of the programs, one of their programs? And then think about, you know, where do these students have an opportunity to demonstrate their learning? So maybe there's a specific course in mind, uh, maybe it's a course you teach, but what is the, uh, you know, place kind of situated within a course, right? And then take a minute to brainstorm, right? How can they show you that they have learned? So again, that's the method. How can they show you? What are they going to produce? Are they going to demonstrate their learning? And then what can we use to ask their learning? Right, so just kind of walk through those steps. What's the outcome? What do you want students to learn? How can they show that they have learned with that method? And then what can you use to assess their learning? What's the measure? So I'm going to take a second to brainstorm, think about that. I'm going to give you guys maybe two or three minutes to think through that. Um, then I'm going to give you an opportunity to share just with your table. And then after everyone's kind of had a chance to kind of talk and discuss with your colleagues, um, then we're going to share a few out to the group of just what does it look like across disciplines to um, kind of figure out where students have an opportunity to learn, what can, how can they show it, and then what can we use to assess it. Go ahead, take a few minutes, two to three minutes, for you on your own, and then I'll let you guys uh, loose and you can chat with your neighbors. <laughs> Yeah. 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 I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to stay in the pusher seat, so I'll come here. 
Oh, it's very much a hole over here. There's a culture of the most pious person. I better John, you stay here. Yeah. 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 Oh. Halfway through, I make all the people. Oh, I got one for you. Yeah. I got one for you. Thank you. 
design a presentation where they could show their creative skills and they could come up with their PowerPoint presentation and then they could describe and talk <coughs> Yeah, that's great. So those can be three different methods. So if you're doing an across course section, it could be any of those, right? But then if you come up with a specific measure, right, what do students have to be able to demonstrate in order for all, you know, the instructors to say, you know, this, these students are, you know, competent in this or have met this student learning outcome. If you came up with a rubric, right, that could be the measure. So whether it's an exam, whether it's a presentation, or whether it's a paper or project, you know, there's kind of some freedom there, but then all students are meeting this level of competency. That's great. Thanks for sharing. What about this table? We have a hard program outcomes is obviously both critical thing builds and yeah. uh, professional writing. So we have a couple of courses that are very writing intensive, including every single assignment, the writing assignment every day. We do a writing assignment. Okay. The writing assignment is created by the instructors who come back to you to fix it, improve on it, and then recreate it. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you're going to reach, you're going to get the higher grade of so all the exams are written exams. It's not multiple choices from all. Sure. Everything is written exams. Okay. We, we do all types of writing. I mean, we do report writing, we do memo type writing and letters. So students, I guess there's not a lot of high school teaching stuff anymore. So the students don't know how, they know how to text, but they don't know how to write a letter or a memo to their boss. So we just assume they don't know how to do anything. And, and that's how we measure it. And I think the measurement is we grade it the first time and we give it to you to fix it, and then it comes back and gets graded the second time. To show that you've improved on the suggestion that we made. Yeah, so what I think look like in terms of program level assessment is again, this is why we always go back to rubrics, right? But that idea of having a rubric for what does it look like and then making it very clear to the students too, right? A rubric exactly is you're developing, right? By the end of this, you know, course or at the end of your program, we want all of you to be at you know kind of this last column where you're showing confidence. And I think in, in that one class we actually do introduce develop a master. Yeah. I mean, because you're, you're not learning anything else in the class other than how to write. Yeah. How to, how to write documents and memos and reports. Yeah. So just it kind of yeah, as I'm thinking about that, the method, right, is these, you know, written papers. But then the idea of having a measure that is shown to the students and to the faculty of this is where we want you to be at the end and this is how you can continue to improve on this rubric. These are the exact areas you need to improve on. And we all want you to be in this last column by the end. So great, thanks for sharing. What about you guys? Please so no scouts, ready? Yeah, I thought yours was the last All right, so I teach this uh, architecture, so I uh -huh. think the appropriate history of architecture and design because I can't remember all of the topics. Um, but it has uh, six of our classes, so there's different mm -hmm. uh, projects or rubrics. So they would be under design projects for the intro class. Be a PowerPoint. Of course, it's a test, final projects, in design classes, which would be a rubric. And then in history, they do reports, so it would be a written report yep. plus a final exam. Great. So it, it hits a different level. Yeah. It's assessed differently in each class. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. All right. What about you guys? We didn't get any. Absolutely. Yeah, like, were, I heard chest x rays. <laughs> I heard a bunch of stuff over there. <laughs> Okay, um, for my program learning outcome, it is, I'm going to represent you, okay, is uh, I teach in the radiology program. Uh, one of the program learning outcomes is to be clinically competent. Um, we have over 100 exams, so uh, one in particular is a chest x-ray, which is the very first x-ray that you do. And so the, we have two different methods, uh, direct and indirect. Uh, the first is to simulate a chest x-ray in the lab, in which we use a rubric. The, um, the second one is to demonstrate that chest x-ray in a clinical setting, which is a checklist. And then the indirect method is once upon graduation, we use an employer survey uh, indicating competence. So that's it. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, sure. All right. Well, we have uh, for the first where the students get the opportunity to learn, have performing relevant and authentic tasks where students can apply previous, new and previous experience. Mm -hmm. And then the second one, how can they show that they have learned? We can apply some BBL if possible. <laughs>
the five W's as well. Students can show that they have learned by explaining almost like a show and tell. Mm -hmm. For example, if they're taking the, let's say they're doing some break, why are you doing it? Mm -hmm. Why are you performing these adjustments? Yeah. If you don't, then what happens? Right. So it's performance as well, but must be relevant and authentic. So PBL, in order to be, uh, I guess the word I'm looking for, efficient, mm -hmm. and for them to learn, it needs to be authentic. Great. Awesome. And the last part, how can we use to assess their learning? Well, I have. Again, that we should utilize authentic and relevant experiences and allow students to utilize whatever previous things they, mm -hmm. they have ever seen. Outside, yeah, and even especially for that demonstration. Yeah, even for that demonstration, immediately what I think of is a checklist, right? Like, can this student perform this behavior? Then it would have to right? be appropriate. Mm -hmm. Whatever you do needs to yep. have these things here. Mm -hmm. Checklist, perhaps. Yeah. Checklist, rubric, right? Can they demonstrate these things? Yes yep. or no? Boom, 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 boom. Right? Yep. Awesome. Thank you so much. Now, hopefully, um, kind of what I want to do with this activity is, again, really root it in what you're already doing in the classroom. I think sometimes when we talk about being, right, like an assessment plan, talking about these method measures, um, we have this language that you may or may not be using already, but kind of developing the shared language together, which uh, it was really great to hear some of you practicing on already, um, but then also to get really deeply rooted in what you're already doing. Okay, when we talk about things like the measures, it's not this abstract thing, it's stuff you're already doing in your classroom all the time, right? And so hopefully this is just connecting that with what you're already doing. And by walking through this process, right, congratulations, you guys just all created an assessment plan. Right, so this is what we're doing moving forward is going to be having some of these conversations, right? Going to be asking these kind of exact questions, which what, you know, what do you want students, what do you want to measure this year, right? What do you want to see if students have learned? Choosing that, um, choosing a method, right? Having that conversation of what can they show you and then having the conversation about what measure, right? What, how are you going to know? Um, what are you going to be able to use to assess their learning? And then that's when you, you know, kind of go out for the semester and you start to collect data on that, right? So what we're really doing there is building that assessment plan. Um, and so this was just a really brief exercise to show you guys what that looks like to kind of talk through um, some of the different methods and measures. And then also to represent that across the college, it's going to, you know, it's going to look different, right? So it's going to be, um, depending on the outcome, even within your own program, those assessment plans can look different. Um, and as well as what we're doing across the college, right? So it's, just, it's all under the umbrella of assessment, but we're all going to be diff doing um, different plans um, and kind of evaluating student learning in different ways. But it's gonna be whatever fits best for the program and for what you want to know, the data you wanna learn from your students. Does that make sense for everyone? Was that helpful to kind of walk through that process? Okay, great. So just a few kind of reminders, um, just to, Kind of again talk about that idea that one size does not fit all, right? So when we're talking about assessing student learning, it's not going to be the same, you know, plan um, across uh, departments and areas. Um, the other thing that I wanted to point out is don't try to do the perfect assessment all at once, right? So the first time this is going to be, you know, an iterative process we're going to learn together, and so some of you have been doing an assessment a long time, right? For this program level. Some of us, this might be some of the first times that we're doing that. You don't have to have the perfect assessment the first time around, right? We're going to be here to help and support you and guide you in that. Um, but it doesn't have to be, be, be perfect and assess everything all at once, right? And then also to allow for ongoing feedback. Again, we're going to run through one assessment cycle. Something works, something didn't work, right? That's okay. We're going to adjust. We're going to learn from that again collectively, um, kind of informed. Maybe you can hear from some of your colleagues what works really well, right? for four round level assessment. For some other colleagues, you might say, oh, I tried that, that didn't work here, I would have changed this, right? And for, for learning for each other as we go through this process. So more reminders, right? There will always be more than one way to measure any student outcome, right? So as we're going through these conversations, you're thinking, oh, I can do it this way, I can do it this way, yes, absolutely, right? There's always gonna be multiple ways that you can measure. We're gonna be having conversations around, you know, what is gonna be the best one for you, or what's the best for right now? Um, there's generally an inverse relationship between the quality 
of a measure and method and their expediency, right? So um, when we talk about things like, um, you know, if we do different methods, maybe we do, you know, multiple choice exams, right? We're going to get really quick answers. Um, for some outcomes, that might be the best way, right? Um, for others, it might not be the best way, right? Um, for especially some of the higher level thinking, um, we may need to go into more in-depth, right, assessment um, uh, methods and measures in order to do that. Um, and so those are going to be conversations that we're going to have, right? What's going to be the best fit? Um, and then we're also going to talk about things like um, affordability, right, and the cost, but not in terms of money, but, but in terms of time, energy, right, um, how long it's going to take to grade those things. We're going to have those kinds of conversations, right, and it's going to be about what's the best fit for the program and for the data that you want to collect from students. What's going to best <laughs> inform improving student learning? Um, all assessment options have advantages and disadvantages, right? So whatever you choose, there's going to be a pro, there's going to be a con, and again, those are going to be conversations we're going to talk through and we're going to come up with the best fit, right? So it's just about what is going to give you, again, that data that's going to be the most helpful. Um, it's never going to be 100% perfect, right? Um, and so we can have those conversations, but again, it's going to be about identifying the data to be the most useful. So just to bring it back, Right? We want to real deep there just to bring it back out to that assessment cycle. This is what we're really after, right? We're after kind of what we've talked about today is identifying those outcomes, which we've done, right? We're going to assess the outcomes using these different methods and measures. Then we're going to take the data, we're going to interpret that evidence, we're going to make changes, right, and plan for those changes based on the data that we collected, and then we're going to implement those changes. Again, it's not an improvement, right? Yes, it's a change, right? We're going to change something in our teaching and learning, but in order for it to truly be an improvement, we got to, you know, assess again and see if students, um, you know, learned as a result of that, right? Then we can really start to call that an improvement. Um, but that's why the cycle keeps keeps moving and keeps going, is because we're just going to keep making changes, um, and again, the most appropriate ones for you, for your program, um, and for what's best for teaching and learning in your courses. So really the essential questions that we're after as we go through this process. How do we know students learn what we intend for them to learn, right? We're coming back to the questions we've asked through the whole course of this process, right? What do we want students to learn? How do we know? Um, what does achievement of learning look like, right? So asking those questions and, um, and building a process that's going to give us those results. And then what have we learned about student learning that we can use to improve or act upon for the future, right? So those are going to be the kind of the framing questions as we go through this process. It really comes back to these questions. The idea that, you know, in this room we should all want the answers to these questions. Right? As, as educators, we want to know um, what achievement of learning looks like, and we want to know um, what we can do to improve teaching and learning. And so as we go through kind of this assessment process, that's the kind of information that we're after. Right? Do you have any questions on that piece? Okay. So it's going to be kind of like the content portion, the, the training portion of today. Now we're moving into what this this time currently was kind of originally intended, which is to talk about what our steps look like moving forward, right? We have um, turned in that deliverable for um, this semester. There's a few of the professional development um, opportunities that are coming up with our learning improvement. We can all touch on that at the end. Um, but really, we've turned in that deliverable for this semester. So what does our work together look like? moving forward, um, and then we're going to talk about kind of that new role that's coming up at the end of the semester. Um, Christopher and I went to a workshop um, that HLC held downtown, and this is probably one of the best quotations that came out of it. Um, Maxie, was this the one? I think Mac Maxie and Allie were there too. I think this was in one of the sessions you guys were in. This is probably my favorite quotation. So. You can tell the quality of an institution by the quality of its conversation. So that I, when, when I relate it to assessment work, it's really that idea of um, we as faculty, kind of the conversations that we're having around our teaching and our learning together, right? Not just ourselves 
in our classrooms, but really together. The conversation that we're having collectively um, is really going to um, impact the quality of the institution. It's really going to raise the quality of, again, teaching and learning across the entire campus. Um, so this kind of conversation, I think, already has been what has made me the most excited about this assessment work this year um, is having you know faculty come together in rooms like this and in our workshops and to hear um, you know us talk at tables the conversations I've been able to engage with many of you one-on-one -on -one. Um, this has been a really really exciting part of this process um, and so this quotation really resonated with me and so this is um, the concept that is really kind of fueling um, our work moving forward and you'll, you'll see kind of how it flushes out in just a second um, so the role of faculty in this work, right? So in course assessment, so when we're talking just you know about your classroom and course level, um, the role of faculty is really to be the content expert, right, in your specific disciplines, um, and then also a facilitator of learning in your classroom. Kind of tying back to the idea that when you're doing assessment in your classroom, right, you're talking about an individual learner, um, you're the content expert who's facilitating that learning. When we talk about program and then focus stay with our program level, but also on our general education assessment, um, faculty become members of a learning community, right? So it's collectively all of us together engaging in conversations, you know, with our colleagues about what students know and then how to improve the learning environment for all of our students. So not just my students that's in my classroom, but our students that are progressing through all of our classrooms and how do we improve the learning environment for all of that. And that happens in conversation with each other. So with that being said, um, the next type of role um, is going to be something called that we're titling um, assessment fellows. And so moving on from this semester, so basically this summer through the next academic year, um, that next role is going to be um, something called an assessment fellow. So I'm going to show you in uh, just a moment what that um, looks like in the details of that. But um, that name and that title is really reflecting that idea of being part of this learning community um, and the professional development that happens um, as a part of this group. And then also, again, those conversations that we're going to be having with each other moving forward. So with this title of assessment fellow, uh, the compensation is going to be $1,500 annually, so uh, the same that you're currently getting. Um, the requirements for this position are going to be to attend one six-hour summer assessment institute. So in that Summer Assessment Institute, we're going to be doing something very similar to what we were talking about today. So we'll be receiving training regarding building and executing um, connected course level and program level assessments. So how do we connect course level assessments with our program level assessments? We're going to be building those out. Um, and, and again, in that workshop, building those assessments um, for the assessment cycle. So the idea being that you'll come in, there'll be several days over the semester, you'll come in to the workshop format that you're all very familiar with by now, right, where there'll be some training, some content, and then a hands-on workshop. Um, the feedback that we continue to receive is that's a great you know, time to carve out the time to get the work done, to receive some of the training, to have that hands-on supported environment. Um, we've heard have positive results, have positive feedback, so we're going to continue that format until you tell us that that no longer works anymore. So the idea being that you'll come to campus, we'll be in um, that workshop, and the idea is that, again, you leave that workshop with your assessment plans ready to go for the fall. Right, so before you come back to campus in the fall, you have your assessment work all set up, how we're going to assess the program level um, learning outcomes, right, and that we're going to plan out for there, um, which ones you're going to assess that year, and the methods and measures to do that. Okay, any questions on that piece? As soon as I go through, we'll leave a lar large section for questions, but um, any clarification on that? So then the next requirement will be to coordinate department level assessment activities, again, pertaining to course level and program level assessment. So working with instructors of relevant courses to implement an assessment plan. Um, the other piece of this is to complete an assessment report. So the plan um, hopefully will be done over the summer, but we'll do at the beginning of fall semester. And then at the end of your assessment, so the very latest, um, in, uh, towards the middle of May, right before you leave May, that will be due, um, but you can turn it in before that as well. 
So a complete the assessment report. And then serve on the assessment committee or the assessment peer review panel. So there'll be you know, more, more details, and we can kind of flesh this out. But we are um, reworking kind of the structure, thinking about um, the structure of the assessment committee um, for fall. Um, especially with the scale of work that is going to be occurring around our program level and our general education um, level assessment. So there'll be multiple opportunities on the assessment committee um, to, um, to get involved, right? So there's going to be a lot of things the assessment committee is going to be coordinating in the fall. So there'll be a lot of opportunity to get involved with a piece of that work. So to get involved with the work that the assessment committee is doing, and then the idea of assessment peer review panel is one of the directives from HLC, um, but also just great practice, is that um, assessment data um, informs resource allocation. So we are going to be rolling out a structure or part of um, the assessment committee um, that's going to be titled the assessment peer review panel. So that panel is going to have um, dollars that can be distributed as a result of assessment data. So kind of more we're going to be, you know, sh kind of sharing more details as that structure continues to be fleshed out. Um, but that is a really important piece of assessment data is that it is then used to allocate resources, right? So we'll be continuing to have conversations about that and kind of be sharing more details as that structure is built out. Um, but that's another opportunity to serve is be a part of that, looking at data and then looking at allocating um, resources to different programs and departments on campus um, as a result of the assessment data. Um, so those are the two, two requirements of that position. Um, and then the link is going to be an annual role. So um, I'll show you in a second when the call for this position will go out. It'll again, it'll start in the summer as you'll come in on one of those um, summer institute days work out your assessment plan, be ready to hit the round running in fall, submitting your assessment plan if you haven't done so already, collecting data over the course of the year, and then submitting the report before you leave campus um, in the spring. Okay, is that clear to everyone the link of that? All right. So um, we're going to follow a very similar format to the position that you're currently in right now. So um, previously when we had talked about the position, it was one per department. Um, but it's going to be, uh, again, that variable amounts, right? So um, department chairs and coordinators will <laughs> work collaboratively with the area deans to determine the number of fellows needed for their area. So again, very similar to the process that we did for your current positions. So if more department faculty volunteer than same is available, the chairs and the area deans will collaboratively select from the volunteers for the recommendation to the VP of Academic Affairs. And then the VP of Academic Affairs will approve all selections for the assessment fellows. So um, again, very similar to what you did, notify your um, chairs and deans by email if you're interested in this position. The deadline to submit your name will be Friday, April 19th. So by Friday, April 19th, please send an email to your department chair coordinator and your dean, letting them know that you're interested in that position. And then um, again, if there are more volunteers, um, then there are fact, or more volunteers than there are positions, um, then the coordinator, chair coordinators, and the deans will collaboratively select that. The VP will approve that process. Okay. So just to give you a little bit of context here, again, the idea of assessment fellows really um, we felt that more actually affected the level of professional development. Um, that you all have invested so far in this process, um, and then also the um, institution has invested in you, right? This this whole academic year, participating in professional development um, and being knowledgeable, right, in that assessment work. So moving forward, um, individuals who have that level of professional development um, and have invested that time, um, you know, will have that that title of an assessment fellow. Um, it also recognizes the connective network and the kind of this fellowship of colleagues who participate in this work. And that was a really important um, concept for us as we move forward. Um, and then again, kind of based on feedback, we really wanted to replicate um, this model that we did this time around uh, with instead of having one person per department, we wanted to allow departments to kind of self-determine the number of fellows. Um, all, again, with the area deans and the chairs and coordinators to kind of come up with the number that is the most appropriate for each department and area. Any questions on the next role? Yeah? So every 
everyone here has to apply to become an assessment fellow. Has to submit their name. Yes, that so they're interested. Yeah. So we did not assume that if we have this work this year, that we will continue next year. We have to formally apply to become an assessment fellow. I'm not going to assume that you want to keep hanging out with me, Matt. Right. So if you want to keep hanging out with me, you got to send an email. Yeah. Yes. I don't want to assume that you know that you're continuing on, but if you would like to continue to hang out with me, I feel like we're having a good time. Um, but if you would like to, then you can send an email. Yep. And again, it'll be collaborate with deans, chairs, coordinators, and then approved by the VP. But that's the motivation. It wasn't the other way around. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you have a date for the summer workshop? Not yet. Yes, not yet, but it will be various times. I'm here all summer, um, so it will be various days throughout the summer. You're just going to come to one. Mm -hmm. So we'll just offer a few. If you guys have, you know, I'm interested in hearing, right, if it's Mondays work better, Fridays work better, right, I'll try to pick, but it's not going to be me on a calendar going, boop, 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 testing what you need. So. Um, any uh, verbal feedback or there's no cards on your table. If that's a feedback piece that you would like to give me, I'm open. I'm here all summer though. Yeah. Would that mean that all, all of us could be on the assessment committee? That would be a really large committee. Yeah, that's where the structure is coming. Okay. So because of the amount of work that's coming in, it's something we're going to look into, but um, because of the amount of work I don't foresee it being successful in terms of like one big table we all have a meeting right so we're going to look into kind of different structures and, okay. and, and have that conversation with the current assessment committee but kind of what that can look like moving forward um the idea of like subcommittees like working groups on different projects so it's not necessarily going to be attending every single assessment meeting through the entire year but getting involved with the different projects that interest you whether that's general education assessment whether it's the peer review panel whether it's helping you plan learning improvement meet next year right so any of those could be potential opportunities so I Maggie you're hanging out with me I know it. I it's have, happening I have a question I always do so bad anyway when we talk about our evaluation do you want us to evaluate the general education outcomes also when we talk about this process yeah. general education outcomes to each of our courses that are going through our program yeah outcomes. so yeah. Yeah. yeah so general education outcomes assessment will be taking um, place kind of the, the steering committee for that is going to be the assessment committee we are going to be at, as far as i know and that's just in my limited time here um, as far as i know we have not directly assessed any of our general education outcomes previously so for example when we this is getting off on a little bit of a tangent but when we've said we're going to assess critical thinking we've assessed at the course level and we linked it up to the general education outcome level we have not directly assessed critical thinking that's changing so as of next year we will start directly assessing general education outcomes and so that is going to take place at the assessment committee level is going to be the steering committee um, the assessment fellow you could potentially be a part of that if that's the initiative you want to join on the assessment committee we would really encourage you but that's not going to be necessarily a part of the stipend that's going to be focusing at the program level. Great question. Thank you for that. But if that's something you're interested in, again, the opportunity to be involved in that work will be there as part of fulfilling part of that um, requirement to serve on the assessment. Any other questions? I'm going to send this out and the information about this out to, to everyone. Um, so as you think about it, um, as you're kind of reading through the documentation, if any other questions come up, please, you know, send an email, let me know. Um, so I'll give you a, time, a little bit of time to think on that if you guys have any questions. Now, the last piece before um, we take off today is um, Learning Improvement Week. Yay! I wish I had a popper. I should have that. Shoot. Something to think about for next Friday. Um, Learning Room Week is going to be April 1st through 5th, so next week. Um, again, that idea of what has previously been Assessment Day, we are extending to an entire week, and the focus is going to be on learning improvement. So um, we're going to have multiple opportunities. Hopefully you guys all got an email from the VP um, with some of those opportunities. 
Um, our very own Maxi and Allie and Angela are going to be leading the um, faculty and, uh, and staff oriented events um, during the week. So I would encourage you to go through, take a look at that. They've been working hard prepping excellent sessions for team staff. So if you can join in that, I um, really encourage you to. Um, it is a part, participation is a part of that's your remaining professional development commitment for the site of position. So participating in that event, um, those events during the week, there's multiple dates and times, or um, coming to our Learning Improvement Summit, which is on Friday, April 5th, from 8.30 to 2.30 p.m. in Cafe 64. Um, because of the length and what this uh, summit is, uh, I'm sure we'll be recording parts of it, but we do need you to come in person, okay? So if that's going to be an issue, please let me know. Um, but we're expecting an in-person attendance for that. So the Learning Improvement Summit again, Friday, April 5th, 8.30 to 2.30 p.m. Um, that, that is the remaining professional development commitment for the stipend. Um, voluntary, right, but encouraged, is the open forum on April 23rd. Again, that's just going to be another more of an info session of just rolling out, you know, exactly the next steps. But at that point in time, um, our, kind of hopefully our, depending on um, how quickly they're approved, um, but the assessment follows will be identified, right, or will be in the process of doing that. And so really just kind of identifying what's next. That is what I hope to share the Summer Institute dates. So um, hopefully our calendar will be set at that point, and that will be the time Again, in person, but that one will be as well and sent out. Uh, we'll be kind of sharing what's next, what's next on the slate, some documentation, and then those summer institute dates I want to share at that session as well. Yes? Will there be improvement with there'll be some activities every day in Cafe 64? No. There will be uh, two events happening here for faculty and staff. There will be other events that will be student-facing. Beth is helping lead those. Awesome. And um, those will be student-facing other days of the week. Um, there's two events during the week here. Um, I can send out the dates and times again. Um, also, you should have received an email from the VP. But then the Friday is what's in Cafe 64. We have to participate in at least one of the days. Yes. But this one, really preferred. So yeah, this one is the requirements. Again, let me know if this is going to be an issue, but this is the one. Which one? April 5th. April 5th. Yeah, the learning improvement. So oh, April 5th. <laughs> this is a requirement in April 5th. If this is going to be an issue, let me know. But I don't remember the email. There'll be reminders. Yeah. You'll get more. Yeah. Yeah. And then can I just jump in on the Summer Institute today? Please. Um, right? They have not there to be determined, right? So let's be proactive. And if there are dates or times that do not work for you, now is the time to make that note, not after the dates are published, right? Because that has been an ongoing problem. With, right? There are required portions of this stipend. And it seems like the day before those required things, people are like, oh my god, I can't make it. No, 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 no. Now is the time to be like, oh. Be happy to come. I just can't make this date this time. Make sense? Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, so one great use for the cards that are in front of you. Another great use for the cards that are in front of you. Um, uh, comments on the Summer Institute days. But any other comments, feedback, questions? Um, if there's something that's still lingering that you're mulling over, that would be helpful if I addressed in my follow-up email. Please write that down. If you have more feedback, again, we're kind of replicating some structures because we've received positive feedback. But if some part of this process is not working for you um, or there's something that we can be doing to improve, please write that down as well. I have many more note cards that you can send. Um, and that goes for anyone who's listening to the recording as well. Send me an email. Um, please let me know, again, any part of this process. Um, it's improvement of student learning, but it's also of our own, right, as we go through this process. So again, great feedback on the Summer Institute. I will read those and pull the calendar out, so please do that. For those of you who are listening, send me an email. I'll incorporate that feedback when I'm putting in the calendar as well, as well as anything else in this process, right? So questions, comments, feedback, 
um, break that down, and um, I read every card, so let me know, and um, we'll incorporate that as we move forward in this process as well. And I hope, I was making a joke with Maggie, but I hope you guys um, have found this year to be really productive um, and um, enjoyable, and I would uh, love to see all of you um, roll over into that role of assessment while we can continue this work together. Yes, Christopher. And one last thing, just to make sure there is absolutely no area of uncertainty, right? It's a summer institute dates. You will attend one of those dates. So there will be multiple offerings who don't mm -hmm. feel like I'm not going to take this type of because I have to come in three times over the summer. Yeah. Be coming. You said this was six hours? It'll be the same workshop oh, okay. format, so right? Workshop so some of you guys are just like, yeah. You breeze in, you breeze out, and you're done. It's Probably, like yeah. A, a small amount of content of just what we're looking for, maybe a review of documentation, and then you're let loose to do the work. If you're done an hour later, great. Yeah. But that's the time we're blocking off. That's how long I'll be there. But you'll be staggering the days. Okay, okay perfect. And you can't have Fridays. Yep. Friday. Look at that feedback. No Fridays. It can't be. Well, it can't, can't be. be. No one here. Yeah. I'm not. I should clarify. I'm not going to be here. Any large questions? Please feel free to ask. If not, thank you so much for your time today. See you guys soon. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Did everyone sign in? Oh, please sign in for your attendance.